Um, let me thank the organizers for inviting me to provide a few thoughts on um, the panel presentations. Um, I don't have to tell you that there's a tremendous amount of um, issues that we should try to put on the table to discuss. Being, being an academic, I'm going to try to do that through scholarly progress through alliteration. All right? I want to talk about some issues concerning the philosophy of cyberspace, second, principles that govern relations in cyberspace. And we've heard some of the, some of the uh, details given by other panelists will fit into these categories. The third issue is power in cyberspace. And the fourth um, has to do with sort of the practical operational aspects of cyberspace and cyber security. And what I want to try to do in laying these things out is also suggest that what the, a real question that we have to face here, and I think it also came up in connection with the, the maritime security issue, is to what extent many of the proposals, some of the new norms which want to move the United States and China into some more practical, we can start doing this tomorrow type cooperation, whether they're going to overcome some of the problems that we see in terms of philosophy, principles, and power. Right, so I think that's a, a question I'll come back to. So just quickly on those issues. What do I mean by philosophy of cyberspace? We know, at least in terms of the development of cyberspace, that we've had what has essentially evolved into be a conflict of what cyberspace is about. And this is usually, and I'll use the, the language even though I know it comes with baggage, the philosophy of internet freedom versus the philosophy of internet sovereignty. We have in cyberspace this problem. We can't ignore it. Right? And it continues to be a deep problem with regards to how various countries, not just the United States versus China, but I think it's a larger issue in terms of the ideology about what cyberspace is about. Cybersecurity sits inside that larger philosophical conflict that we have. In terms of principles, and here again, as someone trained in international law, this is near and dear to my heart, but what I see in terms of principles that govern relations in cyberspace, particularly with regards to cybersecurity, is contention. We've got conflict on the philosophical level. We've got contention about principles. Franz mentioned the agreement, the consensus agreement of the governmental group of experts that international law applies to cyberspace, including the UN Charter. This was celebrated as some sort of breakthrough in connection with cyberspace. Problem with that is it took nearly 10 years to reach that agreement. And the major tension in that was between, I gather, the United States and China. Secondly, that assumes there's agreement on how the UN Charter applies to anything, let alone cyberspace. And we know that's not true, particularly if you think about issues of sovereignty, non-intervention, the use of force, et cetera. We have no end of suggestions for new norms. Right? And the Colonel mentioned that we do in cyberspace have an absence of international agreements international norms, even non-binding codes of conduct remain very difficult for countries to agree to, which is a contrast with the maritime security issue where we've got UNCLOS, we've got codes of conduct, we've got this, we've got that. The problem in connection with that that I see is if we want to sort of multiply norms in connection with cyberspace, are we, are we setting ourselves up to replay the problem that we see happening in maritime security? We have all of these rules, binding and non-binding, yet we have a real problem that still exists. It's not as if more norm multiplication is going to get us out of that contentious situation. Third, power. Here we have competition, right? And we have to keep in mind that cyberspace cannot be cabined off from the larger geopolitical competition that's happening among the, the major powers. Again, not just between China and the United States, but I think amongst major powers generally. And you have this feedback loop that's developing, right? So the more that we have geopolitical competition between the United States, Russia, and China, that factors into how we think about cyberspace, the principles and the philosophy. And the flip side is true. The more that we have this conflict and contention over cyberspace, that feeds into the geopolitical competition because the Internet has become critical to everything. 
governmental, military, civilian, private sector issues. So we have this sort of feedback loop that deepens this sense of the competition of power with regards to cyberspace and cybersecurity. Right on the practical level, I think as has been pointed out, we do have lots of examples where the two countries, China and the United States, cooperate on some of these practical issues. And we've, we've heard about the possibility of, of increasing that practical competition in, in any number of ways. There are also suggestions about confidence building measures that go into this category. And the hope, sort of the unstated hope behind those sorts of suggestions is that cooperation on the practical side will have this spillover or spill up effects on some of these other power, principle, and philosophical issues that we have going forward. Um, and that's a, I think that's sort of the question that's sitting out here because we might be, if we're focusing just on those practical cooperative issues, we might be kidding ourselves that that is going to help us overcome these larger problems going forward. And that's something we may want to uh, discuss as we go to uh, question time with regards to this issue. So with that sort of framework, at least in thinking about how these issues are playing out with cyberspace and cybersecurity, um, I think I'll stop and we can open it up for discussion. Uh, frankly, uh, I don't think uh, at to the moment we've done justice to the uh, depth of the problem that cyber poses between our two countries at the moment. In, in many ways, I, I would I sometimes think that it's more contentious and will be more difficult to grapple with than the maritime challenges that we uh, talked about earlier. But with those happy words of, uh, of introduction, let's open it up to the floor and let's, let's hear from folks out in the audience. Yes, sir. Chinese, you know, Chinese view of the threshold of the use of force in cyberspace. I'm one of the members of the international group of experts that's working on the Talon 2 manual on the use of force in cyberspace and wonder whether there's a body of thought that's prominent among Chinese government officials or scholars on where that threshold lies or what are the indicia for the use of force in cyberspace. Yeah, currently, I think the uh, China uh, don't have kind of uh, a military uh, strategy on cyber warfare. A fall of the U.S. Uh, the other hand is the command control system. Not a. Uh, my point of view is not 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 a created in a new kind of uh, integrated uh, command control control system. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think the China's uh, strategic point of view is to how to defense, how to reduce the, uh, some kind of uh, making uh, some uh, kind of uh, reducing the fragile and the shortcomings in the cyber system to prevent potential attacks by the, by the certain kind of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, cyber criminal, uh, non-state actors, uh, including some uh, kind of uh, illegal intelligence gathering. Uh, as we, uh, I have uh, some uh, chance to uh, dialogue with the uh, American counterparts. Uh, I think the uh, China, both China and the U U.S. Uh, experts, or the former uh, officials, uh, noting that is uh, understanding that both sides have kind of uh, information collection is normal, but opposed illegal information gathering for illegal competition in the economic sides. So uh, at that point, I think China uh, have a long time to go to integrate their system. Now China has a separate system in the cyber cyber, uh, I mean, uh, domain. But the uh, United States have uh, integrated both in the military and national defense level. I think we do have a gap. Uh, as for the, uh, the cyber power, I, I think the, in the future, uh, China, in the, in the trend, I think China try to uh, coordinate it and uh, uh, make a more integrated in the civil, military, 
uh, in, in the government, in the civil military sectors, uh, as a network to make efforts to make a more strong defense system in cyber uh, domain. Uh, this is my, uh, based on my point that uh, U.S. and China should be find some uh, way to cooperation. Uh, now, it, uh, 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 for, for example, the, uh, uh, just uh, Dr. Hongdong uh, mentioned in, in the morning, I think the, in the maritime uh, issues, now China integrate the uh, Coast Guard, the new Coast Guard. I think in the future, in the cyber issues, China also maybe in the future maybe integrate the the, uh, the organization is the contact with the American counterparts. Thank you. Yeah. I, I don't pretend I know a lot about cybersecurity, but I do have a general question for all the panelists. Forgive me if it's really an ABC question. And all of you addressed that the United States and China face common concern in a global context, for instance, the cyber insecurity, such as the hacking. But I think between the two countries, they uh, actually exist some so-called uh, lack of trust between the two countries in their national policy on cybersecurity. So my question is, how the common concern in the global context will be able to drive the two countries to overcome the bilateral problems between the two countries? Thank you. Um, I'm probably the odd man out here. I'm obviously not a cyber war guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> I work on all the methods that actually deal with cybersecurity. Um, and uh, um, I I'm basically highly optimistic, mainly because there's been so much going on. Um, you know, the China CERT is plugged into all the other CERTs. They all cooperate through FIRST. Um, all the, the vulnerability information is shared through the National Vulnerability Database. I think China is creating its own National Vulnerability Database that will interwork. Um, there's just so much going on uh, and a lot of common interests um, that I think uh, um, that, uh, that there's the, the, the problems that have been discussed here I think largely relate to cyber war. Um, with that said, um, I've also, in fact, on the side, written a, a basically a, hundred and a, a, a history of the law on uh, uh, cyber war over 150 years. Uh, people don't know that there's actually been international treaties on this stuff going back to uh, uh, 1850, if you accept the fact that the electrical telegraph was a uh, primitive form of, uh, of uh, internet. Um, and uh, certainly with the arrival of uh, radio uh, telecommunications at the turn of the last century, uh, radio communications have a lot of this, the same attributes as, uh, as, uh, as you know, internet kinds of stuff. Um, and uh, so there is a lot of existing, uh, there are experience and normative provisions in dealing with this stuff. Um, and, um, um, I think we've got some interesting, good opportunities going forward um, in the coming weeks and years, and uh, uh, we'll see what happens. I think the uh, experts from, from China are also concerned about the, uh, you, uh, you mentioned about APT. Uh, because it's uh, seriously threatened by the, uh, basically, infrastructure for, I mean, amount of, uh, uh, both in the uh, government and the civilian sectors. Uh, for example, the uh, banking system. I think the inter. Uh, I think the uh, the infrastructure in the uh, industry system, and the IT uh, facilities, including the military uh, headquarters and the government, uh, the crucial uh, uh, infrastructures, etc. Uh, currently, I don't think the China have a case to find some um, a, uh, a APT, uh, but. Uh, I think the, uh, this kind of threat is a reality. I'd like to suggest that, that if China and US share some case studies, 
case studies. I think it's very helpful for both sides. What, ex what, what about the APT? What, how, to, how, to, how to operate the APT? And uh, what, the, uh, what our two systems have uh, uh, shortcomings to, to very easy to get some uh, uh, a breaking throw attack by some uh, non-state actors and uh, organized crime in the cyber security issues is very important. Uh, would like to suggest that uh, there is a potentially maybe government and the private sectors also have a potential threats. Uh, but uh, how to create a new normal, create a, how to strengthen our capability to defend the potential threats is to study the case study. I, I study the experience. Experience. I just mentioned earlier on in the Middle East, you know that? Not just uh, attack the, uh, uh, the military uh, nuclear sectors, but also maybe we can find some uh, uh, experience to protect ourselves. Yeah, uh, very briefly. I mean, first I would like to say that I think we do have to differentiate when we talk about cyber attacks or instability in cyberspace between those activities that are conducted for the uh, sake of cyber espionage and an actual cyber war, because I think these are two very different things. And sometimes, especially um, in the United States as well, people take the successes, for example, well, quote unquote, successes of uh, Chinese hackers or hackers who happen to be based in China um, as um, successes or as like capabilities that um, actually can also be used during military conflict capabilities that the PLA has. And I think these are two very different uh, things because I think if you really want to engage in, in cyber war, you have to be a lot more sophisticated that, than that what we've seen when it comes to cyber espionage stuff. Um, my second point is that I think, of course, when it comes to Russian cyber warfare doctrine and uh, Chinese cyber warfare doctrine, although there are no official doctrines available. Obviously, we can we know that it's an asymmetrical response to the West to Western uh, conventional military strength, and we have to keep that in mind. So, frankly, in one way or the other, I'm actually optimistic when it comes to cyber attacks and and uh, cyber uh, destabilizing the bilateral relationship between the two countries, at least from a military side, because as Chinese military power continues to grow. It will at some point balance out U.S. Um, and, and Western, uh, Western forces. Um, one thing, of course, that one has to keep in mind that China has virtually no allies, uh, no true allies in, in the international system in comparison to the United States. So that could be problematic. Just a, a couple thoughts on how shared concerns between China and the United States might be able to overcome some of the problems that we've been talking about. The one thing that I think is um, at least a core piece of stability is this de dependence of both of the countries on the functioning of the internet and cyberspace. They're just, just very, from their own raw self-interest, making sure that this continues to function for political, military, economic, all sorts of purposes is one thing which in, in sort of this interdependence way will keep a lid on cyber competition and conflict between the two countries. So it's my perspective that if we are going to see China and the United States go eyeball to eyeball in connection with any issue, it's not going to be, it's not going to come out of cyberspace or the cyber issues. Cyber will be latched on to something much bigger. There's not just going to be a pure cyber war between the United States and China. It's going to come out of some other problem, right? So we, we need to keep that in mind. However, when you think about that functioning of the internet, very practical issue just to make sure it runs and it scales and it continues to add new users and is productive for economic purposes, the internet grew and scaled and functioned according to the multi-stakeholder process of internet governance, which is precisely what China has confronted and wants to change. This is something that Tony was pointing out. That's a really big problem in terms of even the scope of the common interest with making sure the internet continues to function as the internet that we have known. 
right? It's very difficult to overcome that as a political choice China has made. U.S. has made its political choice to support multi-stakeholder governance, and we're at an impasse on that issue. Um, that's not technical anymore. Right? It has become political at sort of the highest levels. And I'm not, I'm not sure I see necessarily that at the moment a pathway out of that because it's become an issue that both deeply, as I said, philosophical, ideological, as well as political in terms of the competition of power between the two countries. Yeah. So there were uh, two questions on this side of the room. We'll take this for Senior Colonel Way. Um, you had mentioned in your comments that you thought that cooperation on cybersecurity between the PLA and the U.S. military was an imperative. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about you know, what kinds of cooperation you envision might be mutually acceptable to both sides. Thank you for a question. I think the uh, basically uh, military relations, military relations based on the uh, uh, the basic the uh, political, I mean, Sino, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, basic relations uh, uh, depends on the mutual trust. I think the uh, we do have a high level of political, economical, and strategic dialogue uh, for the logical issues. We do have this kind of dialogue in the cyber issues, because the two nations, states, uh, head of our two nations, uh, President Obama and President Xi Jinping, also mentioned about the, this uh, cyber security issue is uh, a very important issue for both countries, uh, not just a link with the uh, military side, but also entire uh, society and uh, every people, uh, including uh, use the internet system, etc. So, as a military point of view, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a, it's a way to reduce our suspicious. Uh, I, I think the uh, focus on the further cooperation, because uh, cyber security is, uh, is a global commons, like the maritime in the high sea. So, uh, if we can cooperation in the high sea, why not we, we do have a cooperation in the cyber Security. So it's my uh, basic logical uh, uh, point. But uh, what the practical issues? I think the first of all, maybe I, I just uh, uh, my thing, uh, personal th uh, point of view. It, it, what the definition? So definition is a very important concept or definition of in the in the, in the cyber uh, issues doctrine and uh, political and uh, military intention, something like that. Uh, after that, how to uh, maybe uh, contribute the cybersecurity uh, as more peaceful and more stable and more uh, continue, uh, uh, more, more smoothly and, uh, uh, in the world and the, the two nations? I think they will have a lot of uh, questions we, we do have a lot of uh, mean space to uh, talking about, maybe in the uh, track two dialogue. And after that, maybe you find the uh, uh, 1.5 dialogue. It's OK. Thank you. Um, Yang Hui Song from Academia Seneca, Taiwan. Uh, I, I'd like to raise a, a question about UN system and global governance and the cyber policy and security. Well, um, which UN agency uh, is, is, is in dealing with increasing, increasing threat to the cyber, cyber security? And then the second question is, is any possibility for the United, United States and China to cooperate to deal with this kind of issue, cyber policy and security within the UN system or subsystem? Thank you. Yeah, sir. Uh, having spent 40 years uh, dipping in and out of that system, and including being the ITU Secretary General's Counsel for five years, uh, let me only suggest, uh, give you a short answer, uh, no. Um, why? Um, it's the uh, complexity and the trade-offs uh, really uh, are not amenable to that system. Uh, I'd like to clarify one thing, by the way, right off the bat. Um, although I've, I had an internet account when it was still DARPA in the 1970s, um, cybersecurity does not equal internet, okay? 
Let's get that straight. This, uh, you know, I'm my favorite thing is to hold up my smartphone, right? This thing is not a internet device, although it has got a gateway to the internet. It uses a GSM network, which, by the way, works very nice in China, even up in uh, Yunnan province. Uh, and um, it, um, uh, it doesn't, that, that is not the internet. So the uh, cybersecurity includes a whole bunch of different infrastructures, including uh, some that were mentioned for critical inf infrastructure protection purposes. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a level of complexity that, that does not yield itself well to UN-style bodies. And I can say that firsthand because I've dealt with it for the last 40 years, and I, I'm actually on a delegation right now dealing with this in Geneva, and uh, it is a, a nightmare, uh, even amongst technical experts. Um, it just does not lend itself to, to um, um, that kind of um, uh, dealing with this uh, very well. Uh, I, I think a combination of multilateral and bilateral um, uh, arrangements is probably best. Thank you, Bing Ruwan with Hong Kong Phoenix TV. Um, I want to um, ask about the panelist assessment on the recent President Obama's executive order on the cyber attacks. Um, is sanction really a useful way to either manage or solve the problem? And what's the significance of this move? Thank you. I'll be happy to talk about it because I'm a, I'm a great fan. And as a matter of fact, in the European Cybersecurity Technical Committee, I'm actually um, advancing pieces of that. Um, and as I, I've alluded to the fact there's going to be an announcement sometime in the next couple of days. So it's a really elegant way of dealing with the problem. And the problem, by the way, is, is much domestic in the US um, as it is international. So it basically says there's a need to share, essentially in real time, cyber threat information and remediation information. Mm -hmm. That is how to deal with the threats. And uh, it basically says go ye um, interested groups and set up uh, trust mechanisms amongst yourselves for sharing that information and decide what kind of specifications you're going to use for sharing that information. Uh, and that's sort of what's in play right now. And so for the cyber war guys, you know, that is, at least in my estimation, a pretty good model for dealing with their set of problems. It's the same thing is true for the critical infrastructure people, for the telecom people. And by the way, it's as much a challenge uh, in the U.S. between the private sector and the government with amongst the private sector players and, uh, you know, amongst uh, all the, you know, across the pond uh, dealing with uh, the Europeans because they got different views in this. Uh, I would also mention that one of the early adopters, um, it may not even be well known, is actually the banking and financial community. Uh, who've uh, implemented some of the platforms to do this, and there is an agreement signed in, in, in uh, Belgium uh, apparently last year, uh, essentially a multilateral kind of agreement to share uh, threat and remediation information relating to banking and financial community stuff. There was a meeting out in Virginia about a month ago on this. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of things taking place, but um, as a guy who plays across the, you know, uh, 50 to 100 different venues. One of the major problems here is the stovepiping. People don't know what exists out there, uh, and uh, everyone sort of talks with their own within their own little communities. And we need to find a way of bridging those communities domestically and internationally. And hence, why I'm providing at least some of my time on on an, developing an, what is the ecosystem? What does it look like? And one of the things I'd love to get out of here, if anyone's got any business cards, what does the China cybersecurity ecosystem look like? Does anyone know? Has anyone diagrammed that out? I'd love to see that. I'm not exactly sure which executive order you're referring to, so let me talk about a different one, not the information. I'll, let me talk about the, the one where the United States now is going to unilaterally decide to sanction um, cyber attackers in that context. 
there are different ways of looking at this, but you could interpret that particular executive order as, um, I think maybe you mentioned it, Franz, this, it, this is escalating, right? We're not really going to rely anymore on some of these either existing norms that exist or information sharing. The problem has gotten serious enough that now we are unilaterally going to decide that this is a threat and then we are going to inflict punishment on those that qualify in that yeah. context. If the United States is serious about that, that part of that targeting is at China, right? Hackers in China that acts. I mean, that's directly a message being sent to China. We're not moving in that sort of model in a direction of more and more cooperation on operational issues and sharing information. This has gone somewhere else. It's part of a larger movement you can see with regards, not just the United States, but other countries moving away from either trying to deal with cyber threats in silos, right? Is it crime, is it terrorism, is it espionage, is war? Or moving towards the idea that what we really need to do is focus on cyber defenses, build those up sort of as an all hazards approach to cyber defense. So I don't really care where it's coming from or its source. I can build up my defensive capabilities and protect against all hazards. What we're, we're seeing a movement away from those two to what I call full spectrum capabilities, which is I'm going to have defensive capabilities, but I'm also going to develop offensive capabilities. And the, the idea behind that is to deter serious cyber attacks and if necessary retaliate and if we get even deeper into it then defeat the adversary right and you can see this happen not just in the united states but you can sort of see this happening generally across countries that's a very different model with very different implications for norms and cooperation than many of the things that we've been talking about here i see that executive order as part excuse me as a part of a number of series of policy decisions made by the united states that shifting to that full spectrum capability approach to the problem. It's frankly somewhat of an uh, unofficial cyber deterrent strategy that the United, is pursuing, uh, the United States is pursuing here. Started off with um, vicariously naming and shaming uh, hackers from China through the uh, private sector, different reports that came out. They now come out periodically, you know, every couple of months, you know, a new APT that has been discovered. Well, that didn't really work really, very well. Then you had uh, last May the PLA indictments, right? That didn't work very well either. Virtually no response from China. Now I think the next step is this order, uh, executive order, and what we will see afterwards if this is also not working, which is by the way also a concession to the private sector um, because obviously they have demanded that the United States government should do more about that. We'll probably see like an uh, escalating of offensive um, uh, uh, cyber uh, sorry, of um, active defense in cyberspace, which is very, very problematic because this gets, gets us into a lot of legal problems and issues. But I do think, you know, if this thing now is not going to happen, um, and and you know, things, you know, we will see like a significant significant reduction of cyber attacks emerging from cyber, then we'll be in a completely different environment in a couple of months from now. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Let me uh, give the uh, last uh, observation that uh, China, actually China is a real victim of country to a cyber att attack. I, I think the, uh, uh, I, I read, the new, uh, I read the, uh, some paper that the, uh, the attack, uh, some hackers and uh, uh, non-state actors use the uh, IT address coming from uh, Japan, the United States. In the country, the United States attacked by some find some uh, tra trace some IT uh, address from China, but uh, the other countries also use the uh, IT address uh, from uh, uh, through China. Uh, I think the uh, very complicated situation uh, in the future we uh, should be uh, uh, have a joint research on this uh, kind of a complicated situation. Thank you. So, uh, very last question, then we'll we'll move on to lunch. Thank you. Uh, I'm Sun Jin from Chinese Embassy, but I'm not just speak as my official capacity. I just speak as a legal professional. I, I first answer the question about the cyber warfare doctrine in China. There's no, absolutely no such kind of thing as the cyber warfare because I'm coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Treaty Department, no one Treaty Department. From the international law standard point of view, 
the cyber warfare is still far mature to have clear understandings and standards. If you take the rules about how you char characterize arms attacks, how you characterize act of war into some certain actions is very difficult. From the state practice, we have several incidents about cyber attacks, maybe among to the degree whether it is armed attack or it is cyber warfare. However, the state who suffers this kind of attacks, such like Iran, like EU country, like the DPRK, the state practice silence. So we could not get any clear clues about how you characterize that. So I have two questions about my uh, distinguished uh, speakers from the US. One is about, I, I, I do note that uh, Professor Song raised the question about the approach the US is taken to handle or to deal with the issue of cyber security. You seem to not to only have the bilateral approach. You do not like the multilateral arena. And you mentioned the reasons why you think the UN is a nightmare. But my question is, the UN is a nightmare only to US or also applies to other countries. If you take the cyber area, US is the dominant power. All the root servers, most of them are in US. So US is not only a Chang'e, a strong nation, it's actually the dominant nation. So in this scenario, it is difficult for other countries to only think that US just want to bilateral talks with them. That's why in UN, China and Russia and other countries propose a code of conduct. Okay. So, so can, you, can, okay. you, can you articulate the question, please? What is the question? The question is why US only prefer the bilateral approach? The second question is about uh, how to overcome the difficulties between China and the US concerning the cyber cooperation. You know that uh, uh, we prefer that uh, this issue not only relating to the commercial issue, this only relating to the overall cyber security. That's the main concern from Chinese point of view. So my question is, how you overcome that? You could not just talk about commercial things, you do not talk about overall security issue. So that's my question as opposed to the speakers. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, yeah, just a, a brief uh, answer to the second question. I, I do hope that the cybersecurity dialogue under the security and economic dialogue is able to resume soon. That would be a first step, I think. Uh, other, other answers? Well, um, I'll take a crack at the, f the first one. It's not my impression that the United States only prefers bilateral um, uh, relations or approaches in connection with uh, cybersecurity. The United States is a party to the Council of Europe's Convention on Cybercrime. That's not bilateral. That, that's a, uh, an approach to at least that particular problem that uh, in incorporates lots of different countries. The United States was very keen to discuss that international law applied to cyberspace in the United Nations in the governmental group of experts. It was other countries who were resistant for reasons that don't necessarily have, a, have to do with the hostility to international law, but questions about if we say international law applies, then that creates different ramifications for the legitimacy of different types of activities. But the, the United Nations or the U.S. wasn't opposed to operating with the UN on that particular cybersecurity issue. The United States has not been keen to have internet governance brought into the ITU. So it's a much more complicated situation from the U.S. point of view, um, and I don't think it's accurate to say that it only prefers bilateral relations in connection to how it thinks either about internet governance or cybersecurity. Okay, with that, uh, let's uh, thank our panelists. Thank